Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Well, help me in welcoming Dr. Christopher Howard. He is my next guest host. He's going to be coming on regularly to talk about all things brain health, because obviously we would like to keep all of our memories intact all of our life. And today we're going to be talking about how food impacts your brain health and your cognition. So thanks for joining me. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I always look forward to our meetings. Uh, they're always so much fun, you know, so uh, I think this will, I think this will be really exciting. Me too. So where would you like to start? I mean, I know how certain foods impact my moods, but I always attribute that to blood sugar. So what uh, you said you were doing research like a madman. So I'll just let you take it away. <laughs> um, well, you know what? You know, it's so funny when looking at food and stuff, because we look at it from different aspects, right? We look at it as comforting. We look at it as filling. We look at it as feel. So we can do different things. But one of the things that we really have to begin looking at is just kind of like the way we approach food, even as adolescents, because the way that we're kind of introduced to food is kind of like the way that we stick with food as we get older, or as we progress through life. And, you know, I, and I thought this was kind of interesting, right? Because a lot of times when you talk about why can't there be a Whole Foods in an underserved community or certain people live in a food desert, so forth and so on. But what I kind of found is like sometimes people have ideational constrictions. There's a lot of things that go into it. And I'm always someone that says like there's no easy solutions for complex problems, right? Like there's no quick panacea. So one of the things that we kind of have to do is unpack the problem, right? So sometimes when people grow up a certain way and they make food a certain type of way so even when you introduce foods that they should really relish that they should really enjoy if they don't know how to use it then it really doesn't it's not really helpful right so that's true and it's just one of those things that just kind of stick with you and stuff so it's one of those things that's really important that people learn how to say eat and do different foods also sometimes you have to look at family dynamics right so if you have a blended family what lasts longer, like a bag of potato chips or fresh apples, right? So if you got to feed multiple mouths, more times than not, you go towards the junk food, you go towards uh, the greasy food, you go through, go towards all those things, right? Because those things are a little bit more economical. I could just go to a corner store, get whatever I need, and that's it. But that doesn't bode well for the future. That's true. My dad was a terrible eater. He liked basically corn and peas, potatoes, and beef. He could have mm. done a fried hamburger patty, mashed potatoes, and corn or peas every night for the rest of his life. And if you, just the thought of doing that makes me insane because I like variety and I like to try different things. And I, as an adult, I've had to retrain my taste buds. Like I was not a very good vegetable eater teenager, young adult, but now it's like, you know, I have carrots with my lunch instead of chips. I have, I will eat broccoli. It's not my favorite. I've found that collard greens are better than kale because kale can be a little bit crunchy, hard to cook too. Um, and where I, where I'm at collard greens to me, that's a Southern thing. And I'm in Northern California. So <laughs> well, the first time I tried it, I was like, Oh, these are better than kale. I'm going to, I'm going to stick to that. What I always tell people if they're trying to change the way they eat is to do it slowly. Don't, don't try to make a bunch of changes all at once. You know, like if you're trying to cut back, like I lost a bunch of weight 14 years ago, I think, but I can't believe it's been that long. And I just started slowly cutting out excessive fat and adding in whole grains, but I didn't do it all at once. And so it's pretty much stuck. So I haven't put the hundred pounds back on. So that's a good thing. <laughs> no, that's, you know, that's good. Um, Cause I know me myself, like man, diversity of food, cause I'm so busy, I'm working, doing research, whatever the case may be. And so sometimes it's like really difficult to just like, oh, let me eat this healthy meal. Because sometimes when I get home, it's like, man, last thing I want to do is cook. Plus, I still have other responsibilities that I have to take care of. So it becomes a concerted effort, like saying, hey, I got to eat healthy. So worst case scenario, at least let me get a salad, right? Or at least let me switch up my salad or at least let me start meal prepping and different things of the sort. So that way I I don't just gravitate towards something because it's so easy after a long day to grab something 
fat, greasy, whatever the case may be. And sometimes the body has a propensity of gravitating towards like greasy food. And a part of it is like when people are in a chronic stress, it's something in the fat, greasy food that kind of turns off the stress signals and stuff like that. But what ends up happening hmm. is that when the body is under a lot of stress, the body becomes insulin resistant. So you have like an increase in uptake in like sugar that's in the blood and your body's also insulin resistant. But when you have high insulin, what ends up happening is that the body just have these cravings, 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 cravings for like this fat, nasty food. And so what ends up happening is that you begin to stress eat and next thing you know, you start to get like really, really bigger. And also when people are under like a lot of stress, one of the things that also happens is that the body releases cortisol. So cortisol works in a couple of different ways in terms of eating. The first thing is that cortisol kind of leads to hyper intensity. So now you have that going on, but cortisol is also cholesterol. So one of the things that you recognize about the body is that it always wants to have a form of homeostasis, like it always wants to break even. So if cortisol is a type of cholesterol and you're always under a lot of stress and you're producing a lot of cortisol, um, what ends up happening is that your body's saying, where can I get more cortisol from? Or where can I get more cholesterol from? Fat, greasy food, right? So the body's trying to replenish stuff. And what ends up happening is that it creates this nasty, nasty cycle. And what ends up happening on top of that is that what you start having is oxidative stress. So this is why it's so important to eat like good vegetables and fruits and like different things that have antioxidants in it, because what it does is that it kind of helps moderate oxidative stress. But when oxidative stress becomes a little bit too much, what ends up happening is that free radicals are left behind. And so what ends up happening is that when you have free radicals left behind, this is when you start having like um, the Alzheimer's, you start having like depression, you start, your body starts breaking down. Like the free radicals that are left from oxidative stress is the things that we start to see on the back end, like the Alzheimer's and the mental health problems. So this is why when you eat, you have to be mindful that am I eating healthy? And it's so hard to eat healthy modern times because food is so accessible and you have so many choices, but the choices don't always reflect like positive, good food, right? And I mean, like just being in Provo, I almost wanna say it's like the fast food capital because I see so many different fast food restaurants and they get, it's like part of the culture because a lot of families that sit out younger, they cook and they, whatever the case, but if you're not part of that culture to a certain extent, then it's just kind of like, oh, okay. Let me fend for myself. <laughs> like so, I'm, I'm tired. It's been a busy day. I'll just swing through the nearest drive through on my way home from work. I know a absolutely. lot of people that do that. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's really being mindful. Like, I, I think the biggest thing is because like we kind of discussed like just the, the, the health effects that comes from a diet and how it can lead to Alzheimer's and dementia and it can create diabetes. And one of the things about diabetes is that Individuals who have diabetes and individuals who don't moderate their diabetes and stuff, diabetes leads to a two and a half increase probability of developing Alzheimer's. So we understand like how this stuff works. That makes sense. And I'm wondering, my dad had diabetes. This is why I went on the weight loss journey it was because I had a client, she was a doctor and she told me, you have a family history of diabetes, which is my dad's side of the family you're overweight, you're screwed, which that was the perfect term because I was like, I'll show you, mm, fighting words. And it, it was an effort to find out what like eating plan is not really the term that I like to use, but it, you know, you always hear like, oh, cut back calories, cut back sugar, you know, cut back on, on starchy carbs. My body, I can walk past some fried chicken and it just sticks. So sure. I had to go super, super low fat which I need to lose a few more. And I'm trying really hard not to have to go as low fat as I did because it basically made eating whole eggs impossible. Because I was like 30 grams of fat a day was the max, which is less wow. than half the recommended daily allowance for women. And the positive side, if you could call it that, when you go that low fat, you do not eat super greasy fattening foods because your system, you've ever had a food hangover? I, I tried really hard after going on this plan I, there was like four Christmas parties in three days, like Friday night to Sunday afternoon. And I was, and one of them was at my gym. So I'm eating carrots and drinking water. And I'm, you know, just maybe a little piece of the, the quiche. Like I knew what stuff to avoid. 
They go to the next party the, on Saturday, do the same thing. You know, I don't eat the, the beef croissant sandwiches. I had the turkey one with no cheese. And I was like, by the time I got to the third party, I was nauseous. My system was like, back off, lady. And I didn't even make it to the fourth party. I was so queasy. And I went to the gym Monday morning. And I mean, literally, I must have been green. And I walk in, my personal trainer was the one that taught the spin class. She goes, are you okay? And I said, no. So I feel like I drank a bottle of grease. And she's, <laughs> and I, so I told her, you know, this is what I, and she's like, oh, you, you have a food hangover. And she's like, the only way to get rid of this one, you got to digest it all the way through. But she said, drink as much water as you can. Try to eat anything that you can, like salad, vegetables, like try to have no fat at all, which it's really hard. <laughs> so, you know, once you've lived through that a couple of times, because then we were we were off camera talking on about movies. And so I went to the movies once. I'm like, I'm not going to have the popcorn that's in the oil and all that. That's that it's nasty stuff. So I got um, chocolate covered almonds. Well, I misread the package in the dim lighting in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> so I had too many of those and it was like, mm, I don't feel good anymore. <laughs> So I'm really very conscientious about fat because it does not agree with me at all. It's not fun. But my dad was diabetic and he never really ate the way he should. And I'm wondering if that, my mom was also a sugar fiend. So I'm wondering how much of their crappy nutrition played into her Alzheimer's. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's so so interesting, particularly like when you look at like some of the older generations, because like I would look at the way my dad used to eat and I was just like, man, like, I don't think that's sustainable. Like it wasn't bad, bad, but it wasn't just healthy. Right. Because it was this expectation like, well, I'll just work it off or I'll just do whatever. But then it just got to the point where you wouldn't be able to just work. And but the, the diet didn't change and stuff. Right. And you find like with some generations, older generations, um, they have these ideational constrictions, kind of like what we were talking about before. And when I say ideational constrictions, it's a word that we use in neuropsychology. Essentially, what we're saying is that you kind of have a certain way of just thinking and you don't really expand past that, right? So it's ideational constrictions and perseverations. So perseverations is kind of like, I could show you something new, I could show you something totally different, but you always gravitate back towards what you're most familiar with and stuff. And so sometimes that's what you run into when you're working with like this older population is that they've been doing this for like 30, 40, 50, 60 years. So now you're asking them to change and it becomes exceedingly difficult because it's like, because we all have foods that we really enjoy, foods that are okay, I will eat if there's nothing else, and foods that we just don't like, right? And so sometimes when eating healthy, it's like foods that you just don't like, but you have to find a way to become accustomed to them. And it's also a mental thing because sometimes like when you're used to eating like a heavy meal with the steak and the potatoes and, you know, everything in the sort, and now you're trying to eat light, you feel like, okay, I spent this amount of money, but I'm still hungry. I didn't get my money's worth, right? Yeah. Because like, uh, I know like with my parents' generations and everything in the sort, like, Eating was the way that you showed love to somebody else, right? Eating was an act of kindness. It was an act of love and stuff. And one of the things is, is like, it would be disrespectful if someone offered you food and you didn't eat and you want to get your money's worth because this is what you, this is what you invested in. And so now you fast forward, it's an ideology that some people have. It's like, okay, I'm trying to eat healthy, but I'm still hungry. It wasn't good. It wasn't whatever the case may be. So let me gravitate towards something that I really enjoy. And what sometimes gets people in trouble is, <laughs> they they struggle to count the calories accurately. What do I mean by that is saying, okay, I don't eat as much as I used to. I'm going to have maybe a third of it, but they don't realize like maybe a third is still too much or you doctor up that third. So it's still a lot of <laughs> calories are still not as healthy, you know? So it's just one of those things where it's a level of understanding. When um, I lived in Chicago, I used to work with Mrs. Dale Kane who is a phenomenal person. And what she would do is she would go to these underserved communities throughout the city and stuff and teach people how to eat healthy, how to take what you enjoy and say, you don't need the salt, you don't need the sugar, you don't need the grease, you don't need whatever the case may be. And this is a way that you can eat it and it's nutritious and it's healthy. Because, you know, what you eat affects what you think in multiple, in multiple ways. I had that experience last spring 
It was like two nights because we do a lot of cycling. And any day that I do more than 20 miles cycling, I allow myself to have some frozen yogurt, which is low fat and less sugar. I think well, it's probably not less sugar than ice cream, but it's better, slightly better for you than ice cream. That's how I justify it anyway. So two days in a row, that's what we had at, at night. And the set, like the third morning I woke up and it was just like, I just felt depressed and sad. Now this was like after my mom died and during the very beginnings of the pandemic, but I could almost feel that that emotion was also physical. It's like, I don't think my body's happy about what I've been putting in it. So I'm really <sighs> cautious about now, now I'll only do the frozen yogurt once or twice a month. And it was an interesting experience. And what was the other thing? Oh, when I first started losing the weight, we'd have like Sunday morning, we'd have the, the fried eggs and the hash browns and bacon and toast, which is a lot of carbs and kind of a lot of fat. And I would just like be really easy to irritate, like just the littlest thing. I'd be like, and you know, just like instant angry over just simple things. And I'm like, my dad used to get like this. Yeah, like, I need from? to really watch what I eat. So now it's like, you know, there's, I always have fruit with breakfast. I have vegetables with lunch because those are, you know, well, low calorie. Question, and so did you notice a difference? Mm -hmm. You yeah. know why? Because are you familiar with serotonin? Mm -hmm. Okay. Serotonin is kind of like, it's a lot of things, but for our, for our purpose, it's like a mood regulator, right? It, you know, it, it stops us from being hungry. It just, helps us be the best selves we can be right but 90 percent of serotonin is in our stomachs that so, i didn't know so when we eat bad food right and we talked about the oxidative stress we talked about hyper insulin we talked about all this all this stuff right serotonin is in our stomach and so when we eat bad food what ends up happening is that it irritates our stomach so when we become irritated it impacts our mood and so when you eat bad food and you say, why am I feeling this way? Why am I feeling bad? Why am I feeling whatever the case may be? Well, it's because of serotonin. So what ends up happening is that uh, what we also have is uh, tryptophan. So what ends up happening is that when, because I was reading this, so I want to make sure I say it correctly, but essentially what tryptophan does is that it gets to the blood brain barrier and it turns into serotonin. So that's the way that we can feel like a positive mood. So when we eat bad foods and we have irritable bowel syndrome and we have this a whole bunch of different things and stuff, it's directly related to what we eat and different things. So every, so I say all this to say is that like a lot of things is just kind of cyclical, right? Like, you eat bad food because you're stressed, you know, the bad food is trying to turn everything off. You have more insulin, you can't produce serotonin, and it just creates a bad mood. But aside from the bad mood, it's also making you a uh, higher proclivity of developing diabetes. When you have diabetes, you have a higher chance of developing like a dementia, a higher chance of developing Alzheimer's. So everything's just kind of cyclical and all starts with the decision of what we decide to put in our bodies. Like, I, I know it's like, it, it, cause it's like really super complex and I'm trying to like narrow it down, but yeah. So it, it really just starts with the decision of what we choose to put in our bodies and how do we deal with stress? Because when we're looking at Alzheimer's and we're looking at dementia and we're looking at mild cognitive impairment, we're looking at depression and stuff, all that stuff is a derivative of stress and how do we cope with it? Next to that is how, how do we eat? Like, how do we choose? How do we decide what we eat? You know? men we tend to drink alcohol women tend to eat a little bit more like more greasy fat food coping and stuff like that oh, and though it feels good in the moment the back end of it is that it, it affects your mental you know so then i was just going to do some more research and stuff like that right we have to eat to live right and so what i found is the Medi mediterranean dash uh intervention for neurodegenerative delay diet so it's about full but individuals who follow this diet religiously, the probability of them developing Alzheimer's dropped 53%. If somebody followed it moderately, then the risk for Alzheimer's dropped to around 35%, 30%-ish or whatever, 35%. And it just kind of goes to show, like, there's power in choosing diet. Yeah, I've read about the DASH diet. My only problem is I have tried to retrain my taste buds. I do not like fish. 
at all. Not really? happening. Nope. I mean, like when I was a kid, I didn't even like the thought of broccoli, much less the smell or the taste. And now, like I said, not my favorite, but I'll eat it, you know, because after a while, it's like the other, you know, salad gets really old after a while, especially when it's it cold does. and wet. Mm. Um, I have a really good recipe for it's it's called vegestroni soup. It's basically like it's just a I don't know why they call it vegestroni other than it's cute, but it's just it's just a big pot of soup full of vegetables like every possible vegetable you could want and it's really filling you have that with maybe like a little piece of chicken and you've really filled yourself up and you're fueled for the day but yeah i just i can't i do take fish oil tablets because i prefer to keep my brain intact sure. yeah i've tried really hard that's the one thing that i cannot seem to retrain maybe you know another 20 years i might be able to do it my daughter's trying to eat more fish because she's got Crohn's disease, which causes inflammation in your intestines and your colon, which is real painful. And so she's really striving for more fermented foods and anti-inflammatory foods. So more power to her. She made a, a linguine with, I think it was shrimp or salmon, salmon and something she brought a sample over for her dad and I'm like, and she's like, I know you didn't want to bite. And I'm like, yeah, nope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's tough. Salad does like, man, I applaud people because you know what? I tried a meal prep before and time I get to Wednesday, I'm like, uh, I, uh, I'm over this. I know I got food. I know I hate to waste food, but uh, let me, let me go someplace else where somebody else makes some food. Um, You know what? You know, so funny, like, I don't know if it's part of my generation or what the case may be, but food is so much more accessible, kind of like what we were speaking about a little bit earlier and stuff. So sometimes it's hard to like say, I'm gonna eat something for an entire week. Like I'm going to eat this Monday through Friday and find something new because there's so many different options and things that you enjoy that it's hard to just say, okay, I'm gonna eat the same chicken, broccoli, rice, Monday through Friday. And I think that's gonna be okay, no matter how I doctor up the chicken, no matter how I season it, like, nope. but, but, you know, I think it's with all different foods because there's, I know there's time like where I cook barbecue and it was really good for the first couple of days, but towards the end of the week, it's just like, I want something else. You almost need to take like barbecue chicken and turn it into like barbecue chicken salad, like almost a different whole, like a whole different version. Like we haven't done it for a while, but we made a, it was like a Mediterranean pork dish. And so we had leftover pork and my husband turned it into enchiladas. Oh, wow. Best enchiladas. I don't know now, like we're talking before lunch. So now I'm getting hungry. <laughs> but you know, I've, I've been with, like, it's so funny because we're talking about food, but I was like, man, I haven't even had breakfast today. Oh, I see, I'm the kind of person that, and cause you know, a lot of people like to do the intermittent fasting and I try not to eat for about 10 to 12 hours after dinner. Like I get to a certain point, like after eight o'clock at night, I don't drink anything because then if I do, I, I'm up to the bathroom several times a night, which is annoying. And obviously if you're not drinking anything, you don't need to eat either. So that's at least 11 hours. But I've had people say, well, you should just eat breakfast later. You know, like, cause I eat lunch pretty early cause I eat breakfast at seven and then I work out. And so by 1130, I'm really ready for lunch. And this one guy was saying, oh, you should, you should skip breakfast. It's like, dude, if I don't eat breakfast, it's like the gas tank goes on empty and I literally go back to sleep. My body's just like, yeah. well, no fuel, no functioning. <laughs> you, know, you know, it's so crazy that you say that. Like, I remember in high school, like I was always rushing to get to high school and I never ate breakfast. And the whole first half of the day would like literally just be in the law, you know? And sometimes like if I had a track meet or a football game or whatever, I would try to eat light. But and I was like, man, that's amazing that, you know, you were able to do football practice and the conditioning or track practice and the conditioning and like not really eating for the entire day, you know. But now it's just like I got to get to work early uh, so I could get breakfast. Um, I try to make a healthy breakfast, but sometimes it's hard, you know, because I got the eggs, the sausage, biscuits. But I was just like, at least I'll have fuel, so I'll burn it off through the course of the day. And ideally, I'll ride my bike or do something active and stuff. So um, I still have that to say is like, you know, eating right is a part of the equation, but it's not the entire algorithm. And one of the things is it's like really like finding time to exercise, like really exercise and stuff. 
So that way you could get your heart stronger, get your body stronger, get your muscles stronger and stuff. And that way, if there is like excess sugar in your blood, now it's being used towards something rather than just turning into belly fat. Because when it turns into belly fat, like that just becomes a magnet for weight increase. Like sometimes like you look at people who travel a lot or people who have like super duper stressful jobs or whatever, and they tend to like just increase in weight exponentially, like a lot faster than people who might not have that same job or same type of stressors and stuff. So, you know, there's credence and understanding like diet and exercise. So it's like, okay, how can I, if I can't do the best, how can I combat it? Well, and it I, just has to be something that, that that you're mindful. Inside. Cause like I was talking to a friend and she was talking, oh, well, I need to do this and I need to do that. And I was just like, why don't you develop a walking group, right? Because you get the physical, uh the physical attributes of walking like that's that's good when you're with a group you're talking and now you get like the psychological component you get the good mental health component and stuff now you're killing two birds with one stone because now you feel so much better because what ends up happening with so many people is that they don't want people to know their business they don't want to tell they don't do whatever the case might be and they keep all that inside and and it's not just you know keeping aside and whatever but we look at it from a physiological standpoint and we see how stress destroys the body and it's yeah. just like it doesn't have to be like that and what can you do in order to disabuse the stress in your life the other thing too about walking is the sunlight gives you vitamin d which we need it's important for our health and our brains but it's also a natural mood booster so it's like an mm -hmm. upper a, na a nice positive upper like i know you do a lot of your work via zoom i have a tendency to spend two and a half hours straight on zoom on mondays which ugh, yeah. is terrible. Um, <laughs> so this past Monday, I got off the, the you know, literally, I, find, I actually logged out of a meeting. I'm like, this meeting has been an hour and a half. I have not heard anything crucial. We're at the very tail end. I'm just logging off. Like it was 99% done. And I was cranky. It was like, Rrr. you know, I'm, I'm tired. I'm cranky. And e -e -e. it was just like really not a nice person to be around. And I had two things on my to do list because it's, you know, it's like, 2 30 sure. on a monday before i even have a chance to like start work and all i wanted to do is lay on the couch in my office and just like take a nap i'm like i should just do a 20 minute power nap i'm like i know if i do that i'm not going to get these two items done and then the rest of the week i'm going to be behind schedule so i'm like i know what i need to do and i literally i threw on my tennis shoes the dogs are like wait a minute this is not walking time and i'm like sorry you guys are not going with me threw in my earbuds and i literally walked like it was just under a mile and it was about 15, 20 minutes and it was very windy. So a lot of fresh air and sunny, you know, it was chilly when I got back, I was like, ah, so I start on the first to do list item, which required me to do a task that wasn't on the to do list, which was frustrating. But it was like I, I was able to just roll with it instead of just letting it just affect my entire rest of the day because I had gone outside I'd gotten the vitamin D. And for those people who, I don't know, don't watch the YouTube videos or don't look at any of my social media, I sunburn, I do not tan. And so I have learned exactly how much time I can spend in the sun before I got to put on sunscreen. Now, of course, in January with long sleeves on, the sun was only basically touching my hands and my face. So I didn't have to worry about it, but you know, vitamin D really, it really helped. I was surprised at how much that quick walk around the block just, Oh, I, I have not taken uppers. I don't plan on it, but that's what it felt like I did. So <laughs> it's amazing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it also, after I got back from the walk, because I have an inherited, I, I don't have a sweet tooth. I think like I have a sweet, like all of the teeth <laughs> and oh, it's terrible. And I'm pretty good about having like a Hershey kiss or, you know, just a little, a little hint of something sweet after lunch. I did the walk. I got back started on my work and it was like dinner time. I was like, I did not have sugar after lunch. Double bonus. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You know, you raise an interesting point though, right? Because not only is it about being mindful, but sometimes it's about recognizing our temptation. Like, hey, you know what? If I leave these Reese's peanut butter cups in the freezer, I'm going to eat them. Like I'm always going to gravitate towards them. Like I'm going to remember that I have them. And I'm not just going to have one and stuff. So sometimes it's about saying, hey, you know what? I know what my weaknesses are and stuff like that. So I'm not going to put myself in a situation where, you know, I'm going to undermine what I'm trying to do. 
Um, and, and I think that's the important thing. It's like subtle things that go a long way. It's subtle things that go a long way. So yeah, um, I mean, that's something I'm just kind of working with, with my mom also. It's just like eating behavior and eating habits and stuff like that. I mean, she's pretty good and stuff like that. I mean, she was a home ec teacher, excellent cook and stuff. But sometimes, you know, she enjoys occasional soda. And it's just like, all right, I get it. But like when you get like all this soda, like I don't really drink pop like that. I don't really drink soda like that. So and it's like, I don't want you to go to waste or I don't want you to think I don't appreciate your kind gesture because, you know, food is a way. It's a love that it's an act of kindness. But it's just like, well, what else can we do? Like, what else can we eat that's just as good, just as tempting, that's not a poor nutritional choice? Have you heard of, becomes a, oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Have you heard of Olipop? So it's O-L-I pop, which for not. those of us in California do not call it pop. We call it soda. <laughs> it is a more healthy version of soda. It's got way less sugar, like probably 70, 80% less sugar. It's got probiotics in it. Really? They, no. You can order it online. I think it's drinkolipop.com and you can buy it at Sprouts and Whole Foods and some of those those types of stores. My daughter likes Coke Zero, which definitely not great. She drinks a lot less of it than she used to because she knows that it's not good for her. But, you know, it's like it's hard. My husband runs the same problem. He drinks coffee in the morning, some water and then more beer than he should probably because he doesn't really want to drink sodas. And it's like, what other options are there to drink? Water after a while gets really old. It does. I mean, sometimes you can spruce water up a little bit, like by throwing like a lime or a lemon. But even if still, like I found myself drinking like a lot of water, you know, I mean, that's one of the things like I was kind of saying, like the inverse of it, like I keep a lot of water at the house. So I find myself drinking a lot of water. Um, man, I, I get this from my mom, though, because she loves Coca-Cola. Yep. And like if I have Coca-Cola at the house, like I could go through a whole liter. And it's just like, you can never get enough, never get enough. So it's like, I really don't keep pop at the house because it's like, I know my weakness. I know where I fall short, you know. Um, I mean, man, I love pasta too, which is a, <laughs> which is a star too, which is good because it goes to the belly fat, which goes to the whole insulin component. And I'm just like, man, like, there's not many options. Maybe one day I can find a way to eat air. I'll be okay. <laughs> well, until that happens, you know, I have to be very vigilant with some of the things I select. When you realize how it affects like your mood and, you know, you eat things like because I eat breakfast at seven and lunch around 1130 ish by four o'clock, I'm hungry. Yeah. And so and being the kind of person that I can't just eat the same snack all the time. So I'll have a little bit of a carb and a little bit of protein. And that really fills me up. So I'm not like having two servings of dinner and still thinking I'm hungry because I let myself get too hungry. It's like, you got to learn how to fuel yourself. And that's the one thing that I did when this doctor told me, oh, you know, we got this family history of diabetes and you're overweight and you're, yeah, sorry, you're screwed. It took a long time. And let me tell you, you cannot exercise off the weight because if that was the case, sure. I would be a size two, which has never mm -hmm. been anything in my life. And the one trick that I was told by a trainer that I kind of take to heart but i don't i don't follow it she tries she's got a sweet tooth also and trust me she is a size two and no fat on her at all but she says she will eat her sugar in the morning so that you can burn it off throughout the day when you have your frozen yogurt at night and you're sitting on the couch and then you go to bed all that sugar is just sitting in your system so that's not a good idea so i do try to have if i'm going to have a dessert i try to have it after lunch for that in mind but i work from home so it's not like it's it gets burned off very easily anyway. Yeah, you know, I try to take the same mentality because it's like you got to eat breakfast. And my day is so hectic because it's like you get there, you check your emails or a lot of days we start off with a meeting, so forth and so on. So it's just like, OK, if I could just get this breakfast, I got fuel, I got energy and I'm just moving across the hospital. I'm meeting with patients because, you know, something that people don't really realize is like brain activity takes about 20 percent of your caloric intake of the day. Cause like just thinking executive functioning skills and, you know, just moving. And so yeah, I eat a bigger breakfast and I don't really dwell as much on lunch and stuff. And by the time the end of the day, like four o'clock famished and yeah. I was like, okay, if I can have a salad, then I'll be doing good. And that way, let me just hop on a bike or let me just go by the gym. Let me just do something active for 45 minutes to hour 15 or whatever. 
let me squeeze that in there. So it gets tough and it's not always like that because if you got reports that you got turned in or you got research that you got to look at and stuff like that, it becomes a little bit more challenging to say, okay, let me make it to the gym because sometimes you're just super duper tired. I always tell myself, if I could just make it to the parking lot, then I'm good. And sometimes you just have to will yourself to the parking lot because once you get inside, it's like the competitive nature comes in and you start doing the cardio and you start pumping iron and it's just like, okay, I got a, I got a decent workout in. Let me come home. Let me take a shower and let me get ready for the next day. So one of the things I also want to address also is finding a time to decompress or finding a time to meditate or finding a time to clear your mind because what ends up happening is like when you start having like this oxidative stress and you know it creates like a depression, but costly to anxiety and it can lead to whatever the case may be and stuff. And it's like you feed that and you might just be sitting down and just worrying about something that you may or may not be able to control or have little control of. So you got to find a time to say, OK, like, let me focus and not think about anything, because the same way that you train your body, it's important that you train your mind, because if you're always susceptible to psychopathology, then the psychopathology is, all, is only going to increase because you have no coping skills to break it. So what we're looking at is just kind of like, okay, like diet is huge. We're looking at exercise, which is huge. And we're looking at just meditation, cognitive skills. What coping skills can I use where I'm not just going to stress? Because what ends up happening is that this is when you start seeing like people, like we were kind of discussing a little bit earlier, eating like a whole bunch of bad food because they don't have any coping skills to do otherwise. Or you start seeing people drinking a lot because they don't have any coping skills. And what ends up happening is that they feel elevated because I'm eating this food or I'm drinking alcohol. Well, a lot of that's a depressant. So it goes back to being a cyclical nature. So saying, okay, what coping skills, what problems do I have exist in terms of, you know, just the psychopathology? Because if you recognize that something exists, then you can develop a treatment plan. It makes sense. 2020 challenged all my coping skills. I had to oh, learn absolutely. new ones and then I had to learn more, more new ones, which is not very grammatically correct. And it, it got hard in November when the, my oldest dog passed away and, you know, he was my, literally my shadow. He followed me everywhere. So not only did you miss them emotionally, but like physically, I felt like I'd like lost a limb, like an extra appendage. It was, it's very strange. And there was one day I just looked at my husband, I'm like, I'm out of coping tools. Just leave me alone because nothing good is coming. Cause I was just frustrated and sad and angry and over the pandemic. And just like, cause of course the dog died. And then right on the heels of that, our Christmas weekend in Yosemite got canceled on us. It was like, nope, sorry, the state's closed. No coming here. I was like, can I just have one thing this year? <laughs> it's like, it's one of the things that I worked on because like, it's amazing how like, I don't know about you, but when my parents and I had our photography studio, sometimes you'd, you'd work on somebody's order and they'd come to pick it up and they'd be like, oh, well, there's a five by seven missing or, oh, you're supposed to be this and not that. And you'd be like, oh, I'm so sorry. Let me fix that. And you'd go to fix it and you'd still do it wrong. And then it'd be like, and my dad always said, once an order goes sideways, it's hard to straighten it back out, which I don't know if that was a self-fulfilling prophecy, but I sure. swear we would like, like, it wouldn't be like three mistakes on three different orders. It'd be like three mistakes on the same order, just frustrating the daylights out of a particular client. No, that's how November started for me. It my schedule went off the rails on November 2nd. It never got better. And I started recognizing that all I was doing was like literally chasing deadlines. Like, oh my gosh, I got to write this email for my subscribers. Oh my gosh, I got to, uh, and it was just like constantly under stress. So I spent a lot of December writing down, how long does it actually take me to do this email? I think it's about 30 minutes. Oh, it's more like an hour. There's one problem. So I tracked how long things take. And I build in buffers and then I schedule. It's like, okay, Mondays, I'm usually not, you know, I don't have a lot of mental energy after two and a half hours on Zoom. Like that's that's the whole morning from 11 a.m. to 2.30, 1.30. You know, and it's just like, I'm going to take a walk and then I'm going to do the two things that that fit with Mondays. And by doing that, I'm trying to force into my schedule time in the late afternoon, early evening to do the things I really enjoy. If I have time to do that every day, 
then I can probably put in some more work. But it's just just knowing that it's like, okay, well, if I do these three things on my to-do list, I can do this fun stuff over here. It really helps you keep focused. And one of the things that I've suggested for caregivers is write down how long it takes to do things. Because if it takes an hour and a half to get your loved one showered, hair washed, dressed, a lot, two hours. And then when it takes, you know, an hour and 15 minutes, now you got 45 minutes to just just chill or do something fun, the two of you. And it's amazing how... It sounds like a lot of work. Track how long things take and schedule things. And uh, I'm a super planner, so 2020 killed me. <laughs> <laughs> See, I call it like finding peace in the midst of a storm, right? Like, because the storm is raging. So there's not much you can do about the storm because the storm is going to do what it's going to do, right? But it's about saying, where can I take a break in the middle of the storm where I can find some sort of respite? Because when people don't do that, what ends up happening is this, that's when you start to begin to see like the allesthetic load or the weathering where the body begins to break down. And we understand how caregiving can destroy the body. Um, I mean, I've heard stories and examples and seen examples where a loved one was taking care of somebody who had a dementia and that caregiver went through so much stress that they passed away before the caregiver did, or I mean, before the before the uh, individual with the dementia did. So it's like, how do you find stress, right? And to a certain extent, it's about establishing boundaries. It's about developing boundaries and saying, I'm not gonna do this. This is, because you can't see me draw the table, but this is the parameter that I'm gonna operate in. And anything that's outside this parameter, I can't deal with. I can't manage on this particular day because when you say one, when you say yes to one thing, then four or five other things are going to come in because people or whatever the situation is going to be. It's like, well, remember that one time when you said you're going to do this, this, and the third, and you did it. Well, why can't you do it again today, right? And so it's about saying what you can and cannot do. So sometimes when you allot a certain amount of time and say, I'm going to give myself 45 minutes to send this email. And the moment that is 45 minutes and one second, I'm done with it. And whatever I have is going to be what I said. I'm going to give myself an hour and a half to walk the dog. I may want to go a little bit longer, but I'm going to give myself an hour and a half. And whatever doesn't happen in this hour and a half, I'm done. I got to let it go because if I don't let it go, then it's just going to fester inside of me. And those are the things that make me sick, right? Mm -hmm. So it's about finding peace in the middle of the storm. And you have to know your limitations. I mean, we talk about John Henryism. I think we talked about that in a couple other podcasts, uh, or a couple of our podcasts. And we talked about Super One, Superwoman schema, and all these things where you know all the stress comes and it destroys the mental, the framework. It destroys the mind and destroys the body and different things. So I, I agree with you. Um, it's a good. It's important to establish boundaries. And it's also important to know what your limitations are. And there's no shame in having limitations because what I run into sometimes is a lot of people, they have a certain level of guilt because my mom or my dad or my uncle, my grandma or my whomever, they love me so much. And then with the extra mile for me and now it's my turn to take care of them and I'm being burnt out. But, you know, if I really love them, like I thought I did, then I would do this extra stuff. Having the limitations isn't a reflection of how much you love somebody. But it's also self-care because if you're not here, how can you take care of somebody? Like, how can you show your love if you're not here or if you're in a place where you're like, you're, you're not able to do so? So these are things that people kind of have to become mindful of. Yeah, I agree. And I always tell people, like you said, know your limitations. There were certain things like I only showered my mom once because I'm like, I don't want to do that. I don't think I can do that. And she was at a point where. I had realized, I'm like, every time I come visit her, she's wearing the same sweater. And I had gotten in my car the day after a visit and I was like, my car does not smell nice. This is very, and it's like a brand new car. So I'm like, I did not, I mean, I'm not like, we want to preserve the new car smell, but it's like, I don't want that smell in here. And I'm like, I'm not entirely sure what that is. And so when I found out that she was fighting with them on showering, it was summertime, we'd gone to the pool. It had one of those beach entrances so she could walk in and we were watching the kids and So I I used that, you know, the fact that we'd been in the pool to convince her to get in the shower. And I'm like, I just, I I gave her the shower and it wasn't so bad, but it was like, you know what? I still don't want to do this. This is, you know, this is my mom. And she got really combative about it at the end. And I'm, so I'm glad that I didn't have to deal with it, but 
my grandmother is almost 103 and she has extreme expectations that family will do for family. Okay. Sure. That's, that's fine. But it's only family is doing for one person. There's not really a payoff, right? You know, it's not like I'm doing X for you and you're doing Y for me. There's none of that give and take. And that's fine. I mean, she's almost 103. So it's kind yeah. of, you know, I, I can't expect her to do too much for me. I try to, when I visit her, I try to like, just tell me stories, family stories. I will help you into the restroom if you need it. I'm not wiping your butt. Sorry. That's what the care people are for. And she just doesn't understand that. And it's like, it's so frustrating because it's like, yeah. I have to, it's like, I was not done dealing, you know, barely done dealing with my mom and I started dealing with you. And it's like, I have certain mental, you know, I have to protect my own mental state. And sometimes dealing with her, it's too much. And it's not her issues it's just dealing with my mother and dealing with a geriatric dog and the pandemic and it's like okay my mental capacity for things is way, way lower than it should be today so this is why i tell caregivers i'm like it that is all fine don't let people convince you that it's okay just you can do it it's like if you don't want to do it find somebody that will help you do it and you do other things because there's 5,000 tasks to do every day. Oh, absolutely. And I I tell people all the time, earliest as physically possible, put in a care team. And it doesn't have to be a caregiver that comes in and deals with your loved one. It could be a landscape company or the teenager next door to take care of the yard. You know, like my husband has been, he drives for Meals on Wheels, but he's also been doing a separate grocery run for an older woman that's undergoing cancer treatment because of the pandemic and the fact that she's undergoing treatment, she don't want to go anywhere near a grocery store. And so he does that for her. You know, it kind of drives me bananas that some of these older people don't take advantage of the delivery apps, like, you know, the grocery store delivery yeah. apps, but Man. okay, fine. You know, there's just, there's a lot of ways to take tasks off your plate. Then you can focus on your loved one. And you know, like, you don't, you know, like you can get, there's like all kinds of meal services. I just heard about a new one today called gobble there's you know there's all kinds of meal subscriptions or and i was going to suggest for you since you get tired of eating the same thing is I do. look for sheet pan meals is what you can do is get like one cookie cookie sheet and divide it into three so six servings maybe but three different flavors and I will ask, I know my daughter's done this. I'll ask her, she's coming over later. I'll ask her to like hook me up with some of those and I'll post a link to sheet pan meals in the show notes so that everybody can do this because it's, I could not eat this. Like when you were talking about chicken and rice and broccoli every day, I'm like, uh, uh, no, <laughs> <laughs> I will never be hungry like enough to do that. <laughs> Oh, man, you try to use that mental fortitude and say, okay, I'm going to will my way through this. And it's like, ah, oh, I, know, <laughs> I know my limitations. So, yeah. Yeah. And too, and if it's like, oh, my gosh, I cannot possibly have another piece of chicken and broccoli and rice, then you're going to be like, well, let me just order pizza. So, like, instead of <laughs> instead of trying to, like, have a different healthy meal, now you're just like, oh, pff, forget it. <laughs> I'll just have, the, I'll just have Domino's delivered. <laughs> so, it's, you know, you got to, like you said, know your limitations. and there's just like the internet can be a really bad place, but it can be a really useful place for like sheet pan recipes, which I think I have a bunch I need to add to my website. So now I'm motivated. Oh, uh, let's see. You know, there's just, you have to sometimes think outside the box. Like my husband and I were talking about, I love to schedule my social media. I love to, I love to create it. And it's just a, it's something I like to do. He is not creative. He does not want to do it for his business. And I said, you know, there are virtual assistants you can hire to help you with this. And I got silence, but that's probably because he was thinking about it. <laughs> you know, there's just, there's, once you redirect your focus and you're like, oh, I can, you know, like with meals, like sheet pans, you cook it once. So if you got three different flavors of meals, two servings each, that takes you through the whole week. And it doesn't have to be all chicken. It could, I think you could do like a chicken, a pork and a beef. Pretty sure mm. you can. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that sounds good. I want to make myself a can. note. So when she comes over, I'm like, you've done sheet pans that are different, different, like almost different. What's the right word? I don't want to say ethnicities, but you know, like an Italian and an American Kana type flavor and an Asian y flavor. So, you know, there's, see, there's options. We just have to like get out Absolutely. of our own way, get out of our stuck ruts 
and look for solutions because they're out there. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think one of the biggest things is like really just having a plan and like, you know, I, I don't know, man, these last couple of weeks, like when I work with some of my patients, like particularly the adolescents, because they're in this phase between like 15 and adulthood. And I ask them, like, what is their goals? Like, what are your tangible goals? I get it. Everybody wants to be a rapper. Everybody wants to be a millionaire. OK, whatever. But what's something that's tangible from now until whenever? And the reason why it's important is because if you have goals, you know what you're working towards, right? Like, so if you didn't take a step closer, you knew that you take a step backwards, but without having goals, you're just kind of stuck in purgatory. So I said that to say, it's just kind of like the same thing kind of goes just like with eating. It's saying like, what do I want to do with this diet? What do I want to do with this diet and exercise? Do I want to maintain where I'm at? Do I want to get better? Do I want to lose weight? Do I want to get like Hercules or Atlas or Zeus? <laughs> So, you know, it's one of those things is developing a plan and saying, what am I doing? And that way, you know what you're working towards. Um, yeah, because we understand like the ramifications of a poor diet and how it can create things that do not necessarily have to exist. Like there's always a genetic component. We get that. But there's certain things that kind of feed into that genetic component that makes things like exceptionally worse. And understanding that that exists, it's like, okay, well, what can we do about it? Um, so I always, I always thought, and I, and I go back to Chicago and work with Mrs. Kane, was that just seeing enlightenment, enlightenment on people's faces when they would learn how to like make healthy and different dishes because then people would become motivated. But what makes it more challenging is to find that consistency, right? Like, okay, I'm good for a week. Uh, I did this, I'm eating healthy, I feel a little bit better but I don't necessarily see that physical change. And, you know, I'm busy, I'm stressed, life happens. Let me gravitate towards back to where I used to be at. And the more times you do it, the easier it becomes to gravitate back towards where you don't need to be from a nutritional standpoint. So yeah, I mean, it's just one of those things where it's just like, okay, what is the plan? What am I expecting to see? Let me put the research in so I can better understand it. Well, and the other thing too, I was talking about tracking how long things take. We all know mm -hmm. from, TV commercials that Domino's delivers in half an hour. There are <laughs> lots of recipes you can make in half an hour that are healthy. Absolutely. But you know, sometimes the process of cooking is so formidable, right? Because you see somebody make these exquisite meals or you turn on the TV channel and you see somebody cooking and they're using a thyme and they're using rosemary and they're using things that you wouldn't normally, you know, know how to use. And it's just like, ah, this is, this is too challenging. You know, it's one of those things where practice makes perfect or at least Practice gets you closer to perfection. And it's just taking the initiative and say, look, I'm going to try it. It might not be great, but the more times I do it, the easier it becomes. That's true. Didn't you say you made some jambalaya the other day? I did. Looked, <laughs> looked terrible, but tasted good? Oh, yeah. It, it didn't look anything like I saw in New Orleans at all, but <laughs> it, it tasted pretty good. Um, I'll be honest with you. I had the onions and the diced tomatoes and the peppers and sausage and shrimp, uh, chicken, tea. I saw all these things. I was like, man, this is so counterintuitive or this is so counterproductive to what we were discussing earlier today. But sometimes you got to treat yourself. And that was that, you know, it, it was delicious. I even try to make like a little base for it, you know. It does take like, practice. It does. It does. And patience. Yeah. Well, you know what I always do? is I, I throw in my earbuds and I listen to a podcast while I make dinner. I have learned though, if it's a new recipe, read the whole freaking recipe without the podcast in your ears. Oh, absolutely. Because <laughs> I have screwed up some recipes because I was paying attention to what was going on in my ears and not what I was reading or not, you know, I didn't read it all the way. You know, and it's like, obviously if you're taking care of a loved one at home, that's a little harder, sure. but it's it's one way to get, you know, you can listen to us talking and get some good information while you're cooking and, or, you know, you could listen to something humorous or I like to listen to, um, like I've, I've been listening to one called I spy. It's pretty cool. They don't make enough of them though. Like every season's like eight episodes. It's like, I can listen to that in a week. <laughs> you guys need to make more of these stories, but it's just, it kind of also takes your mind somewhere else. So that's something you can do if, you know, while you're meal prepping, walking the dogs, listen to a podcast, listen to some music, music's good for your brain. And you, you, you pointed out that the jambalaya is not necessarily high up there on the healthy list, but don't have a cheat day, have a cheat meal every week. Sure. Because uh -huh. I, I had a, another trainer point out that if you have a cheat day every week, that's 52 cheat days a year. 
which is almost two months of not eating healthy. It was like, oh man. It's eye opening. Yeah, that's what I thought. I was like, that's just basic math. And I never, you know, just, it was one of those things that didn't cross my mind. And when he said it, I was like, well, dang. Plus, you really don't need like one day where you just go off the rails because you're going to feel like crap. But what I like about what we've been talking about, and I don't want to keep everybody all day because Christopher and I could talk all day, I think, (laughs) is stress is bad for your brain. There's a lot of things we eat that can make the stress in our bodies worse. It can make the genetic component worse. You don't want to be overweight. You don't want to be stressed. You don't want to have memory issues. You don't want to have diabetes. So if you think about the effort that it takes to start shifting the way you eat into a healthier direction and you think, yeah, you know, I'm taking care of my mom or my spouse or whatever. I don't have time for this. Find a way to make some time because you don't want diabetes or Alzheimer's or any of those things. You know, you don't want any of that. So this is the better alternative. Unfortunately, everything is always a little bit of work. So even the, even the fun stuff. Absolutely. I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head. Um, the old, the age old mantra, you are what you eat. Um, so it's just really being mindful of what you eat and understanding that what you eat can create depression. It can create, it can activate uh, anxiety. Um, it can just make a lot of things worse. And when you have depression, it can, it can lead to like different types of cognitive impairment, mild cognitive impairment, uh, a variant form of dementia, you know, just, just different things. So it's, it's, it's good to be able to like disabuse it. Um, also like when, you have um, a lot of stress. You become insulin resistant. You have a higher rate of the de- developing diabetes. Um, so everything just kind of goes hand in hand, you know. So it's just, it, but it all kind of centers on being mindful of what you eat, being active, and finding ways to like find peace in the midst of a storm. And it's not always easy. So nobody's going to say it's easy and it works the first time because there's going to be a number of times where you try it and you kind of struggle or something doesn't go right. But understanding what's at risk and what's at stake, it should be motivation enough to say, okay, well, let me continue to find peace. Or if I got to be the bad guy because I can't take care of my loved one the way that maybe they took care of me or I understand my limitations, then I'll be that bad person. But it's a way that I can preserve my health. So, yeah, I know. I, and I just think those are the biggest things. Yeah. And if, and if you're struggling, when I first started working with the personal trainer and she was 15 years older than me. So it was very beneficial because I wasn't dealing with some young 20 something year old guy that has absolutely no idea what it's like to have an older female body. At first I, you know, I was trying to like cut back on the calories and cut back in the sugar and cut back on the right, all the stuff they tell you to do. She's the one that told me to go super low fat, but, and she also told me don't try to do it all at once. And it, and this weight loss journey that I went on, a lot of people ask, well, how long did it take you to lose the weight? I don't tell them about the time year plus that it was before I figured out the path. It took me like a year and a half to figure out the path to get on to lose the weight. And then it took about two years. So I don't, I skipped that first part. Sure. I looked at it as there is an answer and I will find it. It was like a challenge. I, I looked at I am not destined to be obese all of my life. Now we do have a family history of that too. Like pfft, <laughs> the worst family history for some stuff. Mm-hmm. And I was like, no, I know I, I know my body. It's never going to be skinny, skinny. That's fine. That's not what I'm going for. I'm just trying to be healthy. So I will find the answer. And I did. And I know what I got to do. I'm trying to alter it a little bit. Cause I don't want to do super low fat again, but we're, we're, we're working our way back towards a much leaner food intake, you know, so don't look at it as this giant chore. Just look at it as a challenge. Like I'm going to overcome this. <laughs> look challenge. at it as an adventure. Yeah. You know, cause it's like, you, you'll feel even better about yourself. And, and whenever I read, you know, of course we're recording this January 31st and Christopher is going to be part of season three. So it's going to be a little while, I think before this <laughs> one comes out, but yeah, you always see the, you know, all these nutritional diet things at the beginning of the year. And I, and I read stuff and it's like, yeah, nope, I can walk past a bucket of fried chicken and it just jumps right on. I don't even have to eat it. And I'm pretty sure this is how my whole family is. It's like, we don't have to eat excessive calories or excessive fat. It's just, it's excessive for our physiology, you know, whereas other people can have some fried chicken and it doesn't stay forever. And they can avoid sugar or they need to avoid sugar 
everybody's bodies are different. Everybody's brains are different. So we just have to find what works for you, which I look as an adventure. Absolutely. Well, this has been great. Now that we've been talking about food for like an hour, I'm going to go have lunch. <laughs> I know, me too. I'm about to, I don't, I don't, I'm going to try to eat something healthy. I'm going to find a salad. Um, well, we make all of our own bread. So I'm not sure what I'm having yet, but. As I've gotten older, I cannot have like lunch meats that have nitrates in them. That's fun. I'm really careful on what, you know, when you get a migraine because you've eaten like something that like a hot dog with like nitrates. Whew. I did that at spring training a couple of years ago. Oh, that was awful. So <laughs> it's interesting how as you age, your body goes, yeah, we don't want that crap in us anymore. Don't do that. And we were talking about drinking. So all I drink is water and tea. Yeah. But I um, well, I can't have tea because I'm not BYU, but I do drink a lot of water. We can have green tea or decaf tea. Yeah, I, I got to look at the honor code again and see what type of tea. But I don't think I can have like Earl tea or I don't know. So it's the, it's the caffeine. You're supposed to treat the LDS. I don't know. I don't want to say mantra. That's not right. But their belief is that you are supposed to treat your body like a temple. You're sure. supposed to treat, you know, God created your body and you should take good care of it because it's a gift he gave you. My aunt and uncle are LDS. Okay. The rest of us are not, but that's, that's the theory. So, you know, it kind of ties into what we're talking about. You know, when you put a lot of garbage into your body, it's not treating you very well. And mm -mm. I'm not religious, but you know, if you are somebody help, you know, you were created in God's image, right? So <laughs> I, I don't think God's up there eating fried chicken, although maybe he is, I don't know. <laughs> I gotta stop talking about fried chicken. I'm going to want that. <laughs> But that's, that's the, you know, I I don't know exactly what the honor code is, but I know that's the LDS belief. Sure. You're not supposed to smoke and drink and do drugs because that's all mm -hmm. bad for you, but you're supposed to eat to treat your body right because it's a gift. Absolutely. That, that ties yeah. in exactly what we were talking about. <laughs> it really does. Yeah. So yeah, I'm definitely, uh, but no, I, I really appreciate water. I mean, more than anything, I mean, because like people don't understand that Utah is like a desert, like um, and even though it gets cold, so 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 easy to get dehydrated. Because I remember when I first moved out here, like I won't feel thirsty, but next thing you know, I will like just start cramping up, and I was like, mm. "What's going on?" So now I'll just really focus, and or sometimes I get like cloudy judgment or whatever, and I was just like, you know what? Let me just really drink water, drink water, drink water, and stuff like that. So yeah, isn't our brain like thirty percent water, or is that our body? Uh, that's like the, I don't, I don't know. Uh, um, <laughs> I should know I this. It's because it's like, you know, all the complex stuff, but then it's like, I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's mostly water. Uh, the brain is like really affected by water. So it's always good to stay hydrated. Sometimes yeah. like when you start like thinking cloudy, you're really just thirsty and you're really just dehydrated. So I always wonder what people did in the old days, you know, when you're out working in the field, did they just have like their canteen with them, I guess. I don't know. Perhaps. I don't know. Like, I'm still amazed how people create cross over the Sierra Nevada to get to Utah. Like, if you've ever, like, flown, like, and you see that mountain range, I was like, man, like, because I'm in the plane and we're going 500 miles an hour. And we, I don't know how people, like, it's, it's always amazing how, like, when you get west, people find certain cities. And it's like, wow, that's, that's unique. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.